friends and welcome back to another installment of Professor Pastor Paul's Midweek Bible Festival. We are returning this week to the Bible proper and we have some great stories ahead of us. We're going to be following with Pastor David uh, through the Exodus story. We are returning to Moses and the Israelites who have left Egypt. Uh, they have been through the Red Sea safely, and now they are in the wilderness. So let's pick up with Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. It goes like this. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we had sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So, Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. In the evening, quails came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelite, Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Now this same story is told with a number of differences in Numbers chapter 11. In that passage, there is more dialogue between Moses and God, a bit more uh, back and forth. Aaron is not mentioned, and God comes across as a far less less pleasant character. A plague is added against, a plague of fire is added against the Israelites, uh, oh, and a fire, and when, and, and on two separate occasions, the Lord's anger is kindled against the people. That's in Numbers 11. So the, all these things happen around the same story. But, of course, there are commonalities. In Numbers 11, as here in Exodus 16, we got a few things in common. Number one, the people complain about the journey and wish to return to Egypt. Number two, Moses chats with God. And number three, the Lord provides. Now this story is really foundational to the whole Exodus narrative for us and for our Jewish friends. And it is celebrated throughout scripture. In Psalm 78, we read these words. The people sinned more against God, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? And God rained flesh upon them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. He let them fall within their camp 
all around their dwellings, and they ate and were well filled, for he gave them what they craved. There are also mentions of this throughout other Psalms, Psalm 104, for example, sorry, 105, and other passages as well. So it's a very, very well-known story, the story of manna in the wilderness, the daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread, of course. That in the very Lord's Prayer is a reference to this story. So let's back up and remember where we are. Moses, Aaron, and the Israelites are exactly one month out of Egypt. The people are now hungry, tired, and a little bit stressed out. Even though God divided the sea and led them across the desert in a pillar of cloud and flame, didn't make any difference. The whole congregation complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Grumpy people. They wished to have died in Egypt, wished that God could have killed them in Egypt, where at least they had food so they wouldn't have to starve before they died. You have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They rail at their leaders. You have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us with hunger. Memory is quite a thing, is it not? Looking back at earlier times, we so often recall what was good about earlier times, and especially if things are hard right now. We remember what we lose. In times of difficulty, the past is often whitewashed and cleaned up and made attractive, often for the exact purpose of demonstrating the hardness of the moment of accentuating our suffering. It helps prove our misery to ourselves and to those around us who we feel are responsible. In what ways do we, as individuals, as a church, as a city, and as a nation, whitewash our history and our memories in order to justify our own dissatisfaction with the way things are here and now, today? Well, while you think about that, I should also say that such golden memories are really tricky, both for the Israelites and for us, because they bear a kernel of truth. There were good things. For example, the Israelites did, in fact, have enough food to eat and survive while in Egypt. But this truth is used to prop up a lie. Here the people use their golden day's dream. It was so much better to legitimize their anger at Moses and Aaron, who, as Yahweh knows, are doing the best they can. As we shall see, Moses and Aaron are just people. So there they are, our dear Israelites, a month into the wilderness, angry, hungry, accusatory, and dreaming of the good old days when they were slaves. Into this mess, the Lord speaks. I am going to rain down bread from heaven for you, Yahweh says. Well, this sounds good, doesn't it? The Lord hears, the Lord listens, the Lord provides. Moses must be really happy to hear these words. He could use a little heat taken off of him. But then the Lord has more to say. Each day, the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And in that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. I will test them. And then Yahweh adds that on the sixth day, they should gather enough for two days so that they might properly observe the day of rest, which is not yet officially ordained as the Sabbath at this point in our story. So now the people are being asked to do what Moses has been doing all along, that is, trust the Lord. Moses fought back, remember all those buts, but Lord, how about this, but Lord, how about that, but Lord, how about this other thing? But the people seemed to take it in stride and accept that when you were lost in the wilderness, you have no choice but to do 
two things. Number one, trust God. And number two, take small steps. Actually, these two things are often the same thing. Some time ago, I spent a number of years in a hard wilderness. The trouble was comprehensive. It was personal, it was professional, it was spiritual, it was economic. In the midst of this desert, I heard a kind of call, and I did my best to listen to it and to follow it. But my trouble did not go away for years. In fact, it grew worse, and this is what it was like. During those years, it was like I was in an empty, dark space, standing alone in a small pool of light. I had no idea where I was or what, if anything, was all around me, just darkness. All I could see was that pool of light in which I stood. On good days, I would pray and ask for help. And after some time, another pool of light, just a few feet away, would appear just as the one I was standing in was beginning to fade. So I would jump into that new growing pool of light, not knowing what direction I was moving or if I was getting closer to something good or something terrible or anything at all. This went on for long enough for me to get very tired of it and eventually for me to make my peace with it. I had what I needed when I needed it and no more beyond that. I try to carry this lesson with me now, even though my world, the world around me, has brightened considerably. Anyway, when I read this story of the Israelites in the desert and the daily manna, I remember those years of my life and I imagine that that might have been sort of what it felt like for Moses, Aaron, and the Israelites there in the wilderness. So the Lord speaks to Moses and tells him the good news about the imminent arrival of food. Moses reports this news to Aaron, and then together they turn to the people and spell it out for them, adding in some new information about meat, which Yahweh has not mentioned in our story. They talk about meat. Meat will come, although all Yahweh talked about was bread. Apparently, there is some crossover information from the Numbers account of this story, which featured a lot of talk about the Lord providing a lot of quail, and also some verses about eating a lot of quail. In any case, Moses and Aaron further explained to the Israelites that in the evenings when they receive meat, they shall know that it was the Lord who brought them out of Egypt, and in the mornings when they gather the manna, they shall behold the glory of the Lord in the spirit of Moses and Elijah and Isaiah, who never saw the Lord directly, only the glory of the Lord. In other words, this sustenance is, not, is, the sustenance is given by God, not only that, they, that the Israelites not die, but also that they not forget the goodness of God, that they not forget before whom they stand. Aaron has more to say. He tells the Israelites that though, the, though their ire falls against their leaders, against he and Moses, their real complaint lies with God, not with the leadership. The Lord has heard the complaining you utter against him. What are we that you complain against us? Your complaint is not against us, but against the Lord. This is a pretty smooth theological move there, a pretty smooth political move. It is an arresting and bold move, but it is nonetheless, I think, has carries the element of humility about it. We are but people like you, Aaron seems to be saying about him and Moses, yet we are all under God. We all stand before the Lord. There is no use of making us an easy target. So they inform the Israelites of the quail and manna to come. The glory of the Lord does appear as a cloud, and, the, and in that evening the quail arrive by the millions. And in the morning the manna appears exactly as advertised. The Lord is indeed faithful, and the daily bread comes with nothing else but the memory of a promise for tomorrow. There is no reality 
but the present. There is no reality but the present, friends. All else is illusion. As faithful followers of Jesus, we must make our peace with that. Jesus condemns storing into barns. So, storing into barns, saving up for tomorrow, does not come highly recommended by either Yahweh or Jesus of Nazareth. Do you have what you need today? If you do not, I pray that you might find the courage to ask for it. If you do have what you need today, then count yourself blessed. And remember that today's bread is always sufficient. Amen? Love you, friends. One day soon, we'll see each other again.